I'm Carol Hills. I'm a senior producer and reporter with PRI's The World at WGBH. And today is World AIDS Day. Um, it's not necessarily a day we like to celebrate. But it does remind us that uh, almost 40 million people have died of HIV and AIDS worldwide. Um, and the AIDS epidemic continues to uh, be a stubbornly a strong problem in places like Southern Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the focus of our of our discussion today. We're going to look at one strategy that our panelists have been investigating as a way to uh, to help control uh, the virus and control the epidemic, which is treatment as prevention, which is really using all the benefits that people have studied and learned about from using antiretrovirals and using them, they're, they're causing a sort of general uh, re reduction in the viral loads in people who are taking them and a, the strategy could help really control the epidemic. And if you read the news today or, or followed this carefully, you know that the United Nations is really targeting 2030 as, as a time when um, the AIDS epidemic could be controlled. Um, so I want to introduce our panelists briefly. Uh, to my right, we have Max Essex. He's um, head of the Botswana Harvard AIDS Initiative Partnership, as well as the Harvard um, AIDS Institute. We have um, Shaheen Lachman, who is here at the Harvard School of Public Health in the in Immunology and Infectious Disease Department. Kenneth Mayer is the co-chair of the Fenway Institute, and he's medical research director there. And remotely, we have Mark Weinberg in Montreal. Uh, he's, at the, he's director of the McGill AIDS Center at McGill University. Now, a few um, housekeeping details. Um, this, this forum is presented in collaboration with PRI's The World and WGBH. And we will be taking questions from the online and studio audiences. Um, you can send your questions. Questions from the, for the panelists can be emailed to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu, or you can tweet them to at forum hsph using the hashtag treatment as prevention 2014. And you can also participate right now in a live chat that's happening on the forum site. And I want to start with Max Essex, who has really done pioneering work um, in Botswana and also here, uh, where he's really uh, learned a lot about the impact of, of uh, antiretrovirals. And he's worked in a country that has really welcomed um, research into AIDS and way in, in ways to uh, control AIDS and HIV, um, significantly in ways that some neighboring countries have not. So um, I wanted to have asked Max to first explain um, what is treatment as prevention and why might the strategy work? Thank you, uh, Carol. Treatment as prevention is the use of antiretroviral drugs, essentially the same drugs that are used to treat patients to prevent their death and alleviate their illness. The same drugs to prevent infections and they work that way because they prevent infected people from releasing virus to infect others. And what has worked and what hasn't in terms of the of treatment as prevention? Well, uh, I actually have a couple of slides here somewhere. Um, if we look at prevention interventions in general, there have been quite a few that have uh, been used over the years, some of uh, them working reasonably well, some of them not working at all yet, like vaccines. Um, and virtually all of them are based on the concept that it's the uninfected person using those prevention interventions to prevent their own infection. The sole difference is drugs when used for treatment as prevention, where they're being used by the infected people to prevent them from releasing virus. So it's a totally different concept and one that really hasn't been explored very completely until now. Um, what, inter what interventions have worked the most uh, besides antiretrovirals? Is, is it just far and away uh, more, more effective than any of the others you mentioned? Well, I if we think back to the start of the epidemic um, more than 30 years ago, 
really since the identification of the virus now 30 years ago. We thought early on that vaccines would be easy to make. We thought that drugs to treat disease would be extremely hard to make or impossible. The opposite occurred. We still don't have anything close to resembling a usable vaccine. Drugs have worked extremely well to treat people who have HIV AIDS. And other things like obviously behavior change, condoms, uh, male circumcision, microbicides have worked to some extent, uh, but nothing has worked well enough to stop the epidemic completely and hopefully we'll have a lot more success with treatment as prevention in that vein. Now I want you to focus a bit on the work you've been doing in Botswana, uh, but first I want to show uh, everyone a clip from that to show what's been going on at that um, research center in Botswana. Several countries in, in southern Africa Botswana, Zambia, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Republic of South Africa, Swaziland, Lesotho, all have had high rates of HIV infection that are several fold higher than any other region of the world, including other regions of Africa. So this is where the problem is most severe. In the clinical context of uh, seeing people sick and dying from the HIV, it became obvious that it wasn't only about treating and getting people better, it was about trying to find solutions of how you could prevent and attenuate the infection better uh, and control the epidemic. We're fortunate in that Botswana has been the country within the region that has made the most aggressive action plan to build a strong research program. The building has quite a large capacity for doing research with a very significant research lab as a wet lab and a data center to coordinate information and handling of information from the various trials uh, that are ongoing and space for training people um, who include many people from Botswana, some people from the U.S., especially those from the U.S. being from Harvard University as either undergraduates or medical students or graduate students, um, so that all will work together doing different aspects of the larger research projects we have underway. Now, Max, you and your team of researchers are working in a country with a very high rate of infection, and unlike the epidemic in the U.S., um, it reaches across the population, um, everyone, uh, heterosexual, homosexual, children, women, everyone. So it's a much more, um, it's been, had a much more catastrophic, catastrophic effect. Um, can you tell us what uh, efforts, you, what have you been doing at, at the, um, in Botswana to, to test the treatment as prevention idea? Yes, uh, over the last 15 to 18 years really, we've been conducting trials in Botswana on almost everything, but most of them have been limited trials and more of them have been on treatment than prevention. But we recently initiated a very large trial that's a combination of prevention interventions, but certainly the most important among those is treatment as prevention. And this is a trial that's taking place in 30 villages with an average of about 6,000 people each, so on the order of 180,000 people, which is a large fraction of the population, as you might expect. And the goal is to determine if use of antiretroviral drugs as treatment for prevention can dramatically reduce incidence 
or rates of new infection over a 36 month, three year period. And our approach to that is a little bit different from other approaches uh, for treatment as prevention because it's based on identifying not just who's infected, which you certainly have to do as the first step, but what the viral load may be of those infected and targeting those with high viral load in addition to all of those who would qualify based on some degree of immunosuppression or disease development that they might already have. And do you have any evidence yet that the viral load has been reduced with the people you've worked with? Well, uh, we certainly don't have enough evidence yet on the results, overall results of the trial to say how incidence might be reduced, but we certainly have evidence and, and others have collected that in other ways in other studies that this use of antiretroviral drugs dramatically reduces the levels of HIV virus in the infected people. I'm going to switch now to Shaheen Lachman. Uh, she's here at the Harvard School of Public Health, and her area of research uh, regarding treatment as prevention has been uh, preventing mother-to-child transmission of HIV, which has been a tragic uh, aspect of HIV and AIDS. And um, I wanted to see if, if you could start by defining uh, preventing mother-to-child transmission and how it is a form of treatment as prevention. Okay, thank you. So prevention of mother-to-child transmission really now primarily refers to the use of combination antiretroviral drugs or anti-HIV drugs by mother and baby to dramatically reduce the risk of transmission of HIV from the mother to the baby. And I have two slides that illustrate two key points related to prevention of mother-to-child transmission. The first one really illustrates that from on the left-hand side, in the absence of any intervention to interrupt transmission, between 30 and 40 percent of babies who are born to HIV-infected women will them become infected with HIV. However, when three drugs are given to the mother and some antiretroviral drugs are given to the baby, even in the presence of breastfeeding, we can get transmission down to 1 percent or less. So that's incredibly dramatic, 98 percent reduction in transmission. We may get to this later, but something similar is mirrored in the reduction in heterosexual transmission when the an HIV infected person uh, takes effective antiretroviral drugs. Um, a second slide shows another key point, which is the maternal viral load or the level of HIV virus in her blood is the, one of the most important determinants of whether her baby will become tr infected or not. And the good news, as Max just alluded to, is that combination treatment given as treatment or to prevent mother-to-child transmission can get the level of virus to undetectable which is associated with very low levels of transmission, both from mother to child or in uh, sexually or through other modes of transmission. So I think we have, we've been able to show that biologically this approach works wonderfully well and this has been a tremendous success globally, although as we may get to further in discussion, there are definitely implementation challenges with PM this as well as treatment as prevention in general. What are the challenges? So I think with, so given the number of women that deliver with HIV now, we'd expect about 15,000 babies to become infected, but it's still around 260,000. That's Is that worldwide? Globally. That's still 60% less than at the peak in 2002. So this has been dramatically effective, but we have a long way to go. And the challenges are significant. They are related to making sure that people have access to HIV testing and know their status and that that happens in a timely enough way and that they are able to get to it and don't feel too stigmatized to get tested, that they then are able to link to effective care and treatment and that that treatment is provided in facilities by trained um, healthcare workers or even lay workers with adequate supply chains. So many logistical issues that they're monitored, that they adhere, that they are able to come to the clinic, they have enough money to get there and that stigma or uh, depression or other issues don't get in the way. But that being said, I, I will say Botswana, again, we, we're talking about Botswana, 
last year, 99% of pregnant women were tested for HIV, and 96% of them received antiretrovirals. And while their transmitted to child transmission risk in the 1990s was about 35%, it was 2.5%. And there are eight other countries in Africa that have reduced mother to trans child transmission by more than 50% in the last few years. So it can be done. Wow. Uh, was there any dramatic differences in the reduction in mother-to-child transmission between countries, or was it generally the same? No, I think there, there is dramatic variability, and a lot of it has to do with um, adequate health care infrastructure and political will and also the level of stigma and poverty. So there is a wide variation. We'll be coming back to all these topics, uh, but I want to move to Kenneth Mayer. Um, he, he is... Um, he is medical research director and uh, co-chair of the Fenway Institute. Um, we're switching gears, coming back to the U.S. to get a reality check on uh, HIV. Uh, the U.S. was really the heart of the epidemic um, 30 years ago. It no longer is, but there's still big challenges. Uh, and we're going to start with, um, with another clip, and then we'll get into our discussion. I found out I was HIV positive about a year and a half ago. and. Um, it was quite shocking when I first found out. I was uh, really depressed for a good four or five months. Um, didn't really want to go out. Didn't want to see my friends. Didn't you know? Didn't want to talk to anybody. Just kind of like wanted to sit on the couch and, and not do anything. Well, I'm really lucky. I have a huge group of friends, and they really support me. And I have a great boyfriend that supports me. So. Um, you know, I, I really feel loved and, and, uh, and accepted. When I first met him, I didn't know he was HIV positive, because like anyone with HIV, you don't know right off the bat if they have it or not. And um, we started off as friends, and as we got more emotionally attached to each other, he let me know. He's a lovable guy. I kind of reacted like, you know, so what? It's, it's, it's part of you, but it's not who you are. You know, the, the, the virus is harmful, but Chris isn't. Your life is not over, you know. It may seem like it. It may seem like your whole world is turned upside down. Um, but, you know, maybe that is time for you to, you know, reevaluate things and, and kind of figure things out. You know, since we found out uh, about HIV, um, we've come a very long way, but we still have a long way to go, and part of that is prevention. And in doing so, you need to inform yourself about the disease as well as ways to prevent it. Kenneth Mayer, uh, I wondered if you could uh, react to that clip and also just give us a reality check on where uh, the AIDS and HIV epidemic is at in the U.S. 30 years on. So that video clip and the discussion about Botswana really highlight the fact that we're not talking about one epidemic, we're really talking globally about micro-epidemics. So some of the epidemics are generalized, such as in Botswana, other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. In the U.S., we have concentrated epidemic. We have an epidemic that disproportionately affects discrete communities. Um, and that's true not just in the U.S., but in Latin America, uh, uh, most parts of Asia, where you don't have the same uh, dynamics. So here in the U.S., uh, the p populations that are most affected by HIV are men who have sex with men and transgender women, and disproportionately in the African American community. And it's not in issues of individual behavior necessarily that are driving the epidemic. So for men who have sex with men, there's biological factors. Uh, anal intercourse is much more efficient in transmitting HIV uh, than heterosexual intercourse as one factor. There are concentration issues. So with regard to the race ethnicity, there's issues around poverty embedded in communities, social mobility, and what's called assortative mixing, that people may be more likely to have partners from within their own community. So because we have discrete, um, <coughs> different epidemics, different drivers, we have to have nuanced approaches uh, as we deal with the epidemic. And I'd like to show a slide um, in terms of what we now call the cascade of care in the United States. So the, the idea of the cascade is that you start off in the United States, for example, with about a million people now living with HIV. And despite the advent of antiretroviral therapy, unfortunately, we've not really seen a marked diminution in the number of new infections a year. It's about 50,000 new infections a year in the United States. Uh, what has improved over the past few years is the number of people 
aware of their HIV status. And serostatus awareness is extremely important, both because it allows the person to access care. We also know that people who are aware that they're infected with HIV are much less likely to engage in behaviors that can transmit HIV to others. So that was around 20% uh, five, six years ago. It's down to 12% among adults. But then it's that middle range, getting people who from knowing their status to getting linked to care, getting people um, who are linked to care to start treatment and to stay on treatment and to be virologically suppressed. So still about 70% of people, 70% um, of adults in the United States who are living with HIV are not having this benefit both for themselves in terms of the treatment and the benefit to uh, partners by being virologically suppressed. And it's even worse when we look at young people and that's where the largest number of new infections are occurring. So the majority of young people uh, under 24, excuse me, under 29 years of age um, who are HIV infected are unaware of their infection, low levels of linkage and low levels of virologic suppression. So these are the daunting challenges we face. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, so we really have this incredible opportunity now because we have an increasing array of choices and ways in which we can control the epidemic. Ultimately, we still think the vaccine is the holy grail and vaccine work is, as Max said, we're not there yet, but there, there's uh, some progress. Uh, we also are hoping for cure and there are people in the audience here who are working very hard on that. But in the short term, what we have available are antiretroviral medications and those are highlighted in yellow. So Shaheen talked about mother-child transmission, lowering a partner's viral load can make them less infectious, uh, treating people who are acutely infected. They're hard to identify because when people first become HIV infected, they may have a mononucleosis kind of illness, they may be asymptomatic, but it's getting clinicians to be smart enough to identify people early on in infection, and that's another challenge for treatment as prevention. On the other side, we can use antiretrovirals uh, for prevention in the form of pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this is not a panacea uh, intervention. It's something I would call a retail intervention as opposed to treatment as prevention being more wholesale where you'd like to make it available to whole populations. For pre-exposure prophylaxis, a person has to first think that they're at risk for HIV, be willing to be adherent to medication. So this is an asymptomatic person taking medication to protect themselves against HIV. But there are multiple studies now that show that it can be beneficial. And as Max alluded to, there are other approaches under study now, topical use of antiretrovirals, injectable medications, uh, vaginal rings that are all uh, f going forward in clinical trials. But the last key point is that HIV at, fundamentally is a behaviorally related epidemic. So it's behaviors that people engage in because they're pleasurable, because they procreate the species. And these, are, these um, behaviors um, mean that we have to deal with the human behaviors associated with the reasons why people may uh, have uh, engaged in certain sexual behaviors, maybe sharing needles and other behaviors like that. And we have to think at not just the individual level, because it's not just giving people condoms or giving people a pill. Um, if people are disproportionately likely to be depressed because of stigma, because of their sexual orientation, if people are using substances to self-medicate because of um, uh, difficulties in their lives, those issues have to be addressed if treatment as prevention is to achieve the promise that it now has. And would you say from your perspective dealing uh, with uh, uh, American sufferers of HIV, uh, we're talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, treatment as prevention seems to have maybe have a more immediate effect. You're emphasizing a lot of behaviors. Do you see other forms of intervention and prevention more effective in the current U.S. population of people vulnerable to HIV? Well, for injecting drug users, we know that harm reduction has been incredibly beneficial long before we had antiretroviral drugs, just making clean um, syringes available uh, to people in opiate substitution therapy. So, so that's really, really um, created a dent in that epidemic, and that's why the majority of people infected with HIV in the U.S. are being infected through sexual contact. But it's, I don't see it as an either or. In other words, treatment as prevention, it's just the pills, but the pills don't do any good if you don't take them, and there are lots of reasons why people may not consistently take pills. I feel well, why should I bother? Medical mistrust, if I'm thinking about the legacy of Tuskegee in my community, am I willing to have this person in a white coat tell me to take pills when I'm feeling well? So all those things have to be dealt with at the same time we're advocating uh, the use of the medication. We'll get back to these topics, but I want to uh, shift to our final panelist, Mark Weinberg. He's been patiently waiting on a screen for us. And uh, <laughs> he's director of McGill AIDS Center in Montreal at McGill University. And um, he's going to uh, talk about one concern about treatment as prevention, which, could, which is drug resistance. Uh, but I, we asked him to start by 
giving us um, a sense of comparing the AIDS epidemic to Ebola. A lot of uh, things that were said in the early days of AIDS and HIV are being said about Ebola, a lot of stigma, a lot of uh, alarming uh, statistics. And so Mark's going to begin his, his brief chat with uh, a comparison of the two, just to give us all a reality check. Go ahead, Mark. Hi. Yes, I, I think we've seen um, that there's been a tremendous amount of discrimination against people who have been infected uh, by Ebola. We, we've seen attitudes in countries um, from which people have volunteered in Western Africa and come back home um, that are really very unfortunate in, in terms of stigmatization. And, and this is very, very reminiscent of what we saw uh, during the earliest days of the HIV epidemic um, when there was tremendous discrimination against uh, populations that were known to harbor large numbers of HIV infected persons. Gay men, for example, were discriminated against um, in, in many places within Canada and the United States. People of Haitian origin were discriminated against because they seemingly represented a population at risk. And really, we've, we've turned a corner in a very important way in, in regard to this with regard to HIV. We still have to make, I think, some of the same progress in, in regard to Ebola. But I think as well it's important to point out that the Ebola crisis in the countries of Western Africa that have been so badly hurt um, really runs the, the risk of also damaging our efforts in, in regard to HIV control in some of these same countries. For example, it's not a secret that a disproportionate number of healthcare workers um, who would naturally provide services with regard to both Ebola and HIV have succumbed to Ebola a as a result of their own infections. Public transportation, uh, which is something that HIV infected people require to get to clinics and require in, in terms of getting their drug refills it is certainly something also that is being compromised by the Ebola crisis. So I, I think we'll have to wait and see, and, and hopefully the Ebola crisis uh, will be managed before very long, and we'll be able to put this one behind us. But it's going to take a while yet. And what about the issue of drug resistance as a potential pitfall of treatment as prevention? Well, I think theoretically, uh, drug resistance has been with us really from the beginning of the epidemic. And, and one of the things that we definitely do have to celebrate is, is that our drugs are, are so much better now than the ones that we had available to us um, 25 years ago. And, and also, we have made tremendous progress in learning how best to use our drugs in, in combination therapy. Um, there is no question that when drugs first became available, um, most people who took those drugs uh, really still had very poor outcomes because they developed resistance against the drugs that they were on. Um, that this applies to a AZT, it applies to 3TC, it applies to really almost all of the drugs. And, and it was really only after the introduction of triple therapy uh, that began in 1996 that we started to turn a corner in a very important way and the progress has simply continued uh, in outstanding fashion since that time. And in the treatment as prevention strategies um, that we speak of, um, really drug resistance ha has come way down uh, over the past decade. Um, I don't think anyone would say that it's no longer an issue. It, it certainly still is, but it's a much less important issue than it was. In fact, the most recent drug to have been approved by the FDA, notably dolutegravir, is one for which there is still not a single case of drug resistance among the thousands of people who have received this drug in first-line therapy. And, and that really is very important progress. Um, clarify for me one thing. When a person is taking antiretrovirals over a period of years, does the type of medication, the type of ARV they're taking, does it change with the advent of new drugs? Or once they start on one, do they stay with it? Well, if a physician uh, starts a patient on a regimen and, and the patient is doing well, and then newer and better drugs come out, it will be a decision that will be made jointly by the physician and the patient in terms of whether to continue on the same old regimen or whether to switch 
to a new regimen for which there is now accumulated evidence um, that the newer regimen may well be safer and, and more durable uh, in regard to both suppression of viral load and as well uh, mitigating the, 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 the possibility that drug resistance will occur. Now, I want to uh, shift our discussion to a uh, more general back and forth with our panelists. And I'm going to start with Max Essex. Um, from your perspective, what would it take to, to use treatment as prevention um, on a grand scale to really try to control the epidemic, given the issue of uh, access, cost, uh, you know, possible um, uh, drug resistance, um, the whole, you know, compelling patients to take it, uh, long-term effects. So what, what, do you, what do you see as, how do, would you really implement it from where you sit? Well, first of all, I think we need a bit more research evidence of not just that it works, but how well it works and how cost-effective it may be from the standpoint of reducing uh, costs per new infection above and beyond other approaches that might be used for the same purpose. And then, assuming we have that evidence quite soon, and I think we will, then it will take the will of a lot of um, international leaders from not just Western countries, but leaders in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where the epidemic is at its peak, and the will to uh, work with, and certainly the World Health Organization, but other international agencies as appropriate to provide adequate testing and identification of positive people and administration of antiretroviral drugs rapidly after testing to those who qualify. Um, and Unfortunately, th those sorts of activities, especially when they're undertaken on a major international level, uh, take a while to implement, but they shouldn't take as long for this particular approach of treatment as prevention as they have taken for many other approaches because the evidence is now um, becoming so strong that that there's so many more benefits than disadvantages with this approach. I also invite the other panelists to interject uh, on this topic. Um, but what would be the way, I mean, given that cost will be a serious issue, um, what would be the way to reduce the cost if, if people are going to be on these, you know, for decades? There are a number of initiatives underway now. So one, one issue is task shifting. In other words, uh, the, the treatment in the beginning, um, people were very sick. We started treatment treat, when had people had very advanced HIV infection. Um, it was prerogative of the subspecialist. Um, now with a, a finite menu of medications and algorithms for, for management, uh, starting people on treatment and monitoring people over time doesn't necessarily require somebody to be subspecialized and certainly uh, supervised uh, nurses, um, uh, their models that show that that's a successful model in some parts of, of the world. So, so that certainly decreasing the complexity. Part of it is um, uh, people here uh, at Harvard and other institutions doing cost effectiveness analyses showing that people staying in the workforce for longer periods of time are going to be a net uh, saving to society. So I think that's partially making the case. But it's not a small undertaking because the good news is people who take the medications consistently are going to live many years and that means that they will be um, populations that also will be part of the transition to chronic diseases in, in developing countries as well. So uh, people do have to look at it at not just as giving people a pill or only treating HIV but thinking about the impact on the healthcare system and the workforce more broadly. I think just to add to what Ken uh, mentioned, I think PMTCT, or prevention of mother-to-child transmission, is believed to be cost-saving. Not just that it doesn't cost that much, but it actually ultimately saves costs compared with allowing transmission to occur and treating infected children. And UNAIDS, as many of you are probably aware, um, today is really trying to push their 90-90-90 initiative, which is diagnosing 90% of those who are living with HIV, getting 90% of those individuals onto antiretroviral treatment, and having 90% of those on treatment 
suppress their virus effe with effective treatment. And they are estimating, and again, these are models, and it's very helpful to have real world data, but with their best estimates, that by 2030, that will avert 28 million new infections. And actually, if you take into account the additional costs of treating those additional infections, and not even including the economic downsides of all of those ill individuals not being able to work, it won't actually cost more. I mean, people may question that, but I, I, I think it is really important to look not one or two years down the road, but look 10 or 20 years down the road. How far away are we from the 90-90-90? How many people are right, you know, getting tested, getting what they need. So it's very variable, again, by country. And as Ken mentioned before, every epidemic is a little bit di different. But globally, the 90-90-90 translates into having about three quarters of all people living with HIV having undetectable virus. And right now, globally, we're at 38 percent. So we need to double that. Again, some places have managed to do that. It's achievable. It's a huge investment. And I think we're all hoping that other tools in combination, circumcision, pre-exposure prophylaxis, behavior change, um, maybe things like cash transfers, and hopefully, eventually, better prevention methods and vaccines will come in over the next decade or so and make this more doable. But in some, we're about half of the way there globally with wide variation between countries. But if I could just chime in, we have to be, be cognizant of the fact that our success in converting HIV from what used to be a death sentence into what is now a chronic manageable condition means that every treated person will hopefully live out a reasonably long lifespan. And that means that as we achieve more and more success, the total, of number, the total number of people around the world who are living with HIV keeps going up each year, which means that the cost of providing treatment for all of these people on an ongoing basis, in fact, keeps rising as well in spite of all of the progress that we keep making in terms of preventing new infections. And many healthcare economists have pointed out that this really means that we, we have to find a cure. Um. I wondered, it seems like any plan, whether it's 90, 90, 90, or treatment as prevention as a way to get there, requires a lot of cooperation um, among a range of, of governments and entities and, and research labs and, and people. Um, how, how realistic is it to get that kind of global cooperation on this? I mean, is there evidence so far that, that when advances are made that everybody kind of gets on board, or are there persistent outliers who are just not going to participate? I think there, there are persistent outliers in almost any international plan, um, not just related to HIV AIDS. And I guess that comes back to Mark's point about the need for a cure, because um, even if it's 90-90-90 or 99-99-99, we will still have some fraction of people infected with HIV for their lives, lifetime infections, and obviously any breaks in their going off drugs for any reason would result in subsequent transmissions. So unless or until we have some approach to totally eliminate HIV from the body, we won't be in a situation where we can um, talk about eradication of the disease and the infection from the human population. And I guess the way that plays into the international government cooperation issue is that the um, lag behind such things as testing and stigma associated with positivity, uh, it seems to me that it will be quite a long time before some populations in some parts of the world um, will be in a conducive environment where widespread testing is totally accepted and people are mobilized for that purpose and stigma is diminished to zero, uh, unfortunately, with a pessimistic 
hat, I guess I don't see that happening real soon. Yeah, I, I, I concur with Max. I mean, the, sci the science has been iterative, and the great thing about research, when it's done well, it has a translational ability for other areas, other diseases. So the way in which we monitor people with HIV now by um, um, quantifying the amount of virus, that's now um, translated to hepatitis C management and really helped leapfrog um, being able to test and evaluate effective treatments for hepatitis C, which is um, a huge uh, public health problem as well globally. But the issues around stigma and deciding on behaviors that are not socially sanctioned, um, not being acceptable in certain societies is really impeding the global, global effort. In uh, Russia and uh, other countries in the former Soviet Union, uh, the criminalization of um, uh, opiate addiction uh, is so problematic and they're having huge rates of increases. So it's like putting out fires and other fires pop up, uh, but oftentimes because of the social and political environments uh, in which people at risk for HIV are living. And you're not gonna wanna get tested if you're gonna end up in prison. You're not gonna wanna disclose your status to new partners. So um, those issues have to be addressed as well. Mm -hmm. Societies, uh, we all agree on the importance of, of testing and being able to treat people who do test positive for HIV, and Shaheen made this point very strongly. It's important to point out as well that in societies in which HIV is criminalized, the, the message that is being sent to people is maybe you shouldn't get tested, because if you get tested, you're going to be perhaps at greater risk for, for being charged with a crime and imprisoned, particularly if it can be shown that you actually were responsible for a transmission. So, you know, the, the public health message in regard to getting tested is somehow exactly the opposite uh, of the message that the criminal justice system is sometimes sending out in certain countries. We're going to switch to the question and answer portion of the forum, and we're going to start with a few questions from our online audience. Thanks, Carol. We have a number of questions coming in from Twitter and on email. Um, let's see. Here's one. How many antiretroviral drugs are currently approved by the FDA for treating HIV? And how many of these same types of drugs are available for use in Africa? Anyone's welcome to chime in? Maybe we don't know specific amounts, but I think it, the question was, of the ones we have here, what, what is the similar usage in Africa? I mean, the, the total number is about 30 globally. I mean, there, there are certain drugs that have been phased out and um, other antiretrovirals that are in various fixed combinations, so that's even a little more than that, but that'd be the, the overall playing field, so. Yeah. And I would say maybe a third of those are available in resource-limited settings, but really only a handful are used with any regularity due mainly to cost concerns in combination with effectiveness and toxicity. Yeah. Max, how many are used in your work in Southern Africa? Well, I, I was just going to add on Shaheen's comments that of the third, one-third of the 30, 10, 12, that might be available um, in sub-Saharan Africa, you wouldn't want to use about half of them <laughs> because uh, they're no longer um, very useful uh, uh, considering toxicity, et cetera. Um, at any point in time, we are doing trials with different drugs, some of which obviously are not yet available through full licensing in that situation for that use. But in the case of a major trial, such as the combination Botswana Prevention Project um, that I mentioned, we're really testing only one treatment as prevention viral regimen, which is a uh, triplet, which is essentially the same drugs that um, many people use in this country for treatment of AIDS patients. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take one more here from Twitter. What is or could be the role of smartphones in expanding ART coverage? There's, that's a great question. There are some people in the audience who are actually studying, studying questions like that. And I think one of the more frequent uses of smartphones thus far that has been tested is in the realm of trying to support adherence to antiretroviral medications. So, 
These are drugs that have to be taken on a daily basis. People can forget to use them or stop taking them for a variety of reasons. And smartphones, I think, have shown some promise in trying to reach out to people and remind them to take their drugs, to check on how they're doing, and maybe remind them of upcoming appointments. And there are people testing the use of smartphones for other platforms, delivering uh, guidance to healthcare workers or lay workers in the field in terms of um, treatment or standard of care algorithms, um, and potentially even uh, getting results from more centralized laboratories to more distal health posts and, and even to individuals. So it's, it's very promising and, and, and exciting. And as many of you know, in many resource limited settings, um, people have access to smartphones either themselves or through a friend or a neighbor or a relative where they would absolutely not have access to landlines. So it's promising. Thank you. Yeah, and, and actually I could add to that that there are studies planned um, by faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health to address questions of the use of cell phone to uh, analyze networks in terms of who might be most likely to be infected next and get some messaging to them before they're infected. Doesn't that tread into confidentiality issues? Uh, not uh, if it's done without identifiers, at least in the research <coughs> context. I would like to take a few questions from our studio audience. Thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Julie Thorne. I'm doing the Masters of Public Health here. And I have a, a clarification question and then a follow-up, if that's OK. The first is um, using treatment as prevention. Is that continuing that in spite of having like an undetectable viral load, sort of persistent usage? OK, and so then how are you finding the community response sort of in light of the fact that there's a lot of focus um, in terms of protecting autonomy and lifelong pill therapy and wanting to take pill, pill breaks and, and not wanting to use it if their viral load is undetectable. So what kind of com like you know HIV community response are you getting? So, so treatment as prevention, and I actually like to think of it more as treatment as treatment, because I don't think most people, I would not, as altruistic as I may want to be, take lifelong treatment on the theoretical benefit of tr preventing transmission, it is also beneficial for the individual's health. So it really is treatment with an immense prevention benefit. And the reason it's, I think, often referred to as treatment as prevention is, is <coughs> because guidelines generally, especially outside of the US, stipulate starting treatment when people's immune system um, it has worsened and the CD4 count has declined <coughs> below a certain point. And so we often refer to treatment as prevention as treatment for everybody else who does not yet warrant treatment by those criteria for their own health. But once started, the idea is that it would be continued indefinitely. And I think one important point there is that most of the individuals who start treatment before their immune system <coughs> weakens will untreated progress, have disease progression to requiring treatment for their own health within a couple of years. So we're, on general, talking about adding a few years of treatment to decades of treatment, which I think is an important part of this, uh, the financial equation. And in terms of a, a community acceptability, I think this is a, a big wild card. And I, there are these large studies that are trying to look at expansion of universal test testing and treatment or treatment as prevention. And it's, I think, a little early to say. And I think one of the interesting questions is, how do we now go back to the community and say, um, this has your health benefits for you and it has prevention benefits. How do we most effectively communicate that? And how can we do that without confusing healthcare workers and communities who for years in places like Botswana and Sub-Saharan Africa are used to hearing, you start treatment when you get sick. Um, so I think that is some, one of the things that we're trying to establish and we don't really yet know. The other part of your question about taking drug holidays if a person's undetectable, there have been a number of studies over the years try, uh, trying to do that, looking at whether you can um, limit the amount of drug exposure and uh, whether that made sense. And none of them have ended well. So um, it's, it's, yeah, you know, because the, when you're giving three drugs, they don't necessarily all go out of the body at the same time. So, so it's a perfect scenario to select for resistance. And, and the whole question is about 
people's ability to, to know exactly when to go on and go off. So, so it's not considered a feasible strategy, at least at this point. But there are new medications. So, so treatment today is not what treatment may be like even in five or 10 years. There, there are two injectable antiretrovirals that are under study potentially as combination antiretroviral medications. So that may eliminate um, the need for daily adherence. But each of these approaches is, is not without its own potential Achilles heels. And if, if you're on medication where you only have to come in every two months, but then something happens and you don't come in a month later, you're at a vulnerable window period, particularly with drugs that have a very long half-life that sub-inhibitory levels may be around for a long period of time. So it is a work in progress. And I, th I think the treatment as prevention in some ways is a disservice for the individuals, because as Shaheen points out, we're at, this is still a one-by-one one decision that people are going to be making as people living with HIV. So treatment as prevention is a great mantra when going to the World Bank and going to other funders to say there's this added prevention benefit if we expand treatment, but we really have to focus on the individual when they're committing to a lifelong uh, uh, regimen of antiretroviral medication. Yeah, the other point I'd like to add to that is at least for our treatment as prevention trial in Botswana, it specifically targets people with high viral load above and beyond those who would require drugs anyway for their health situation. And the reason we believe that that's particularly relevant is because people with high viral load deteriorate fastest. and. Um, therefore, there are people who would need drugs relatively soon anyway, whereas in some other treatment as prevention studies, it just includes everyone regardless of whether or not they have some innate mechanism to control virus replication. Another question? Yes. Hi. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Noor and I'm an MPH student in global health here at the school. Uh, my question is for Shaheen Lachman with respect to cash transfer incentive. Um, if you could tell us a bit more about what role they can play in adherence uh, to treatment, please. I'm definitely not an expert in this, but I, ca I can tell you that a, a recent HPTN study, which actually maybe Ken, do you want to speak about it? Well, it well it so a, a recent, very recently released results from a, a study here did show that relatively modest amounts of money given to people who are living under very challenging economic circumstances in the urban U.S. actually tended to increase the rate of keeping appointments and probably the rate of adherence. And uh, interestingly, I think a lot of that money was spent not on luxuries or anything fancy, but on necessities, including things like medication copays and food. Um, so these are really impoverished communities. And, and then uh, there are other studies ongoing um, in sub-Saharan Africa looking at cash transfers to reduce risky behavior to keep girls um, in school and reduce their, their risk of HIV acquisition. Yeah, no, it, if you think about the cascade, people are looking at incentives at various stages of the cascade. So incentives to test, incentives to link to care, and incentives to maintain virologic suppression. And there are studies also, um, for example, a study in Mexico City looking at male sex workers and incentivizing um, coming in without SDIs or incident HIV. And um, the whole discussion about moral hazard comes in people saying, why are you incentivizing people for engaging in behaviors for their own health? Uh, but, but again, um, behavioral economists can show that with very modest incentives, this can really facilitate motivation. And uh, again, we're talking about the long-term benefit to the community to not see HIV spread uh, more rapidly. But it's, it's a very active field of investigation now. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Um, this is from our chat. In your opinion, would it be more beneficial to focus on the sociological impact of AIDS in communities or the physical implications the disease has on the body? In other words, for preventative purposes, which is needed to be addressed first? I, I would say that it would not I would not feel that it would be ethical to offer or encourage antiretroviral treatment for individuals if we did not have evidence that it was good for their own health. And I think that, that knowing that has been a prerequisite to moving towards more universal expansion of treatment. So I think that's a, pre that's a first prerequisite in the spirit of do no harm. But I think we have enough evidence to know that that is generally the case. Thank you. 
Well, I want to, we're winding up the forum, but I would like each of our panelists to uh, end by giving their own policy recommendation uh, that they think if they would love to see followed uh, to leave us with some food for thought. Max, do you want to start? Well, I, I would say that those of us who come from backgrounds of research and, and want to think creatively about what to do for the future, I, I, I would say for the behavioral uh, people and, and those looking at social issues, how do we control stigma and get everyone to test? For the biomedical people, I would say, how do we best address the issue of cure as defined by ridding infected people of all virus or viral genomes? Um, I think each of those are formidable challenges. Shaheen. I would say that while we live in a time of scarce and dwindling resources and less and less, I think, enthusiasm for supporting treatment of HIV internationally in a sense that maybe we've taken care of HIV, I would say that now would be a really bad time to pull back on uh, trying to expand treatment efforts for a couple of reasons. One. Um, we know that there are millions of people living with HIV and millions more who will become infected. So it's, it's not a trivial problem and has deep implications for young adults and for children and their health. So for ethical reasons and for reasons of our humanity, it's, it's, it remains an incredibly important epidemic. Two, it would be like driving in a motor race and taking your foot off the gas as you start to see the finish line. I don't think expanded treatment will end the epidemic entirely. I don't think any of us expects that, but it is incredibly important and it's a win-win. And I think we will lose more um, in terms of global health and financially if we pull back from the fight now. Yeah, I think the issue of political will is extremely important. Uh, uh, more resources are going to continue to be needed to really adequately address the epidemic. Uh, you know, treatment as prevention is, is a mantra, and it's not just about pills. So we have to think about resources to train providers to provide culturally competent care. Um, we need to think about the resources to elicit histories around um, depression, substance use, understanding relationship dynamics, because all of these are factors that potentiate HIV spread. And again, if we're successful in getting more people on medication and living longer productive lives, we have to also integrate this with the rest of their primary health care needs, because these are individuals who will develop chronic disease over time. It doesn't do us a whole lot of good to be treating um, HIV and not be treating other diseases. And if people have finite resources or have medical complexity because they're getting um, treatment as prevention in one siloed setup, and they have to go elsewhere for other care. This has implications on their health care um, benefits uh, from the treatment. And Mark Weinberg. I already gave you one recommendation, which is that HIV transmission should not be a, uh, a criminal offense uh, because it discourages testing. And it's vitally important that we test as many people as possible in our populations for HIV infection. As Max stated, we know that people who have high viral loads are mo most capable of transmitting HIV to others. And it is a fact that the viral loads in infected individuals are usually the highest very shortly after infection, which is precisely the time that many people are not yet aware that they in fact are positive for the virus. So we have to do a much better job at expanding our network of people who are tested so that we can identify the people who are positive, get them on treatment as quickly as possible so that viral loads will come down and then those people will no longer be infectious for others. Well, we've come to the end of our forum today. I want to thank our panelists and our studio and online audiences. And I hope you will all continue the conversation on the forum website, which is forum HSPH forumhsph.org. Thank you so much for being here today.